beings to call down from the heavens or up from animals. I was in love, terrified, and as the text says, the mind is never at ease upon a socket slope. It went down like this. As she exited the shower, grabbed her towel, I felt not a voice, not a flash, or the quivering fade out movies contrived to such effect, but a swift severing, like the strike of a blade, my mind eye snatched a glint of the samurai katana, surely wielded, I later divined, by a gaunt legislator priest of the not so holy invisible. It cleaved, God, what a woman, what a gift, the steamy air, and laid open the dilemma. Some men are bound by the misery of a single pleasure, others to a misery of not knowing which pleasure is theirs. Our pact, a kind, a more fatih and Rokian math, carried over its unimagined pain to deviations all too not imaginary. Splitting griefs, guilt for undone acts, chances left with chance. Who at last will care if I forsake the pine trees, the wisteria, or the yellow roses, if I choose dumplings over the cherry blossoms? In what equation is sacrifice either square or root? So this, this book is, I have another poem. I probably shouldn't read it because it's kind of long, of trying to uh, put visionary moments into poems, which can be hard or agonizing. Oh, here's one. This, this is a manageable. This is called My Initiation into Poetry. So I'm sitting out back drinking a micro-brew the neighbor gave me that finishes on a rich almondy note with hints of chocolate and smoke, swatting mosquitoes out for a blood meal, but looking forward to dinner. The open shed, half catastrophe, half ransacked labyrinth, taunts me, dares me to configure and keep it as if I lived here. The baby toddles under the sheets, hanging from the line, lets out a cackling laugh, turns and does it again. He stops, points, and says, Kaka, Kaka, as the dog pulls in its haunches and with a furtive look of shame begins to shit. This is my life, I realize, as though it were a revelation, a still moment similar to one I had on a similar October day, kneading manure loam and planting pansies, which it surprises a lot of people to learn have antifreeze in their veins and thrive in winter. Then, without any further prelude, I see this vision of the naked king crucified to the lopped oak and watch the dancers, red-eyed from the acrid smoke of the sacrificial fires, stamping out the measures of the dance. Their bodies bent uncouthly forward with a monotonous chant of kill, 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 and blood, blood, blood. That last bit is actually from a, a book by Robert Graves called The White Goddess, who says that the, the title comes from that book as well, The Initiation into Poetry, and he, he said that this is kind of what has to happen if you are initiated into poetry, and I, I wanted to have that experience. Here's one, I don't think I've ever read it out loud, which is a good reason to do it. And it's called Maculate Conception. No stars, no kings, no prophecies, no barren wounds miraculously opened, just the slow, steady play, inning by inning, of a disciplined defense. We wait for the waking of Brahma, to stir against whatever the neighbors bang on, to shake off the worlds that pass themselves for dreams, to stumble in his midnight naked for the bedside yarrow stalks, and later, the change of linens. We won't deny the divination or a need for insufficient language to suggest or speculate on a special use of the ordinary one. We shouldn't deny that somewhere there's a place where theories can exist without the burden of prediction. And a realm, at least, where the statistics we're amassing are more than trivia, more than pink streaks on a stick you pissed on, more than our need to know the meaning of what changes, thunder over water, Earth over wind, that stain, that spotless stain. So there, there's a, one of the threads that runs through this book is uh, about a 
miscarriage. There's also there's a baby that comes with the baby, as you saw in the initiation in the poetry. And this is a poem after the miscarriage called My Last Fetus. Like you, I'll keep it brief. We feel anger, sick, despair, numb, relief in no right order. Vexed to learn that nothing soothes, nothing can be said that zeroes out in consolation. Your brother hurdles along his way, oblivious, but it's not personal. We go about ours as the living must, and obviously it is. I sense you among the patient choir of the unborn, where the aborted, the miscarried, the cessated ectopics, the test-tubed and petri-dished gather but are bored. Who would happily trade that cloud kingdom of grace and equanimity for a taste of workaday desperation, who swear they would be grateful for every seizure and spasm? Sorry, I really am. Things didn't pan out, chromosomally. She has named you Clementine. So, I will pause there and read a few new things. This is from a book that will be coming out later this year, called Sure Extinction. This is a poem called Everything Remains to be Done. When a houseboat rocks against its mooring and small waters plash against the dock and waves recoil against incoming waves and by perfect math cancel each other out, no one complains of waste. No one bothers to measure the fraction of the whole displaced by the sum of all floating craft. Is this a meaningless gesture to steady yourself at the edge of spilling over into someone else, even if that someone else is who you were all along? We know in advance all change is negligible. It's like when Frank O'Hara wrote in a letter one March, you fragile woman whose profile barely discerns. He, of course, could not have foreseen how profile would come to mean online identity, or just how perishable a thing a person so conceived could be. How easy it is to follow or befriend another without leaving the house or opening your mouth. And while we could argue ad nauseum over which dead people would have loved Facebook and who would have tweeted, it's hard to imagine a world in which Frank O'Hara wouldn't eat up being in two or more places at once, wouldn't love the idea of liking in any form, if he'd survived into the digital age, he'd have answered a few of our most pressing questions, such as, does it take more courage to opt in or to opt out? Will Moore's law apply to affairs of the heart? But just as astronomers turned one holiday into two when they moved the official part of spring back before the equinox, just as a Frank O'Hara poem gives the illusion of being knowable and utterly unknowable at, at once, so some days it can suddenly turn on you. I carried the selective Levis around Chicago one long weekend and took it out by a single took it out but a single time on the subway, led with sadness after parting from an ex-lover with whom I had lunched. I turned naturally to elegy with a thimble full of water in the cage and couldn't shake these staggered lines. It meant you were no longer permitted to know or to decide for yourself whether there was an angel inside you or whether there wasn't. Later that night, at dinner with a friend, a seven-course prefix, I'm so provincial, I'd never even heard of ceviche. I troubled over becoming one more middle-aged man who, failing to know himself despite trying, resorts to quoting Dante. She had asked me, are you happy? A question for which no miserablest has an answer. Nothing is true, after all, only truer and less true. So you qualify, you stipulate, you resolve to chthonic and ichthyonic metaphors you're not a sign of the shadowy ineffable, but just one more means of conjuring what you think you need but cannot have. Like hope, I said, in the promise of transformation. But fortunately, just then, the braised lamb au jus arrived. This one is called Spare Myths. It comes back to me, always at precisely the wrong occasions, the time doing wind sprints up a hill, and I quit halfway up because I forgot why I'd started. I wonder how I'll feel this summer when I return to that hill, years after the fact, and now bad hips keep me from running at all. It's true how far a little of some things go. There's a small prayer chapel whose wood sponsor, which few, if any, ever visit. 
Once I had a secret lover who I'd met after work, and we'd often go to this reservoir or that boat dock and watch the sunset. I remember swearing to myself I'd never miss a sunset whenever it would open me up or coincide beautifully with, say, a murmuration of cowbirds or a touch of the hand at just such a critical transition. And even though I failed miserably to even approach fulfilling that vow, I remain sensitive to shifts in light throughout the day that remind me I'm capable of love. We are rightly awed by flocking behaviors. Even from here, I see two people come together and kiss before walking on together like joined atoms. We hardly care what size we are. I'm so much larger than so many things. We're so fragile, and the stakes are so high for us, it's not worth the wonder we'd have to expend to be happy. I keep my dream catcher far away from the bed so as to let one gift of my life at least have a fighting chance for escape. That one's kind of dark. I'll leave the dark poems to Jennifer. <laughs> uh, so this poem is called Slow News. These are momentary sensations, the wild, the windswept. I am a prairie, a mountain, a hurricane, etc. The sun sinks, but only appears to. The same is true of failure's rejoining effect, how it finds, or maybe is, a sinkhole in which we burrow and feel finally at home with who we are. You are nothing like me. See, we are in it together. The yellow jacket is easily mistaken for a honeybee. Still, it matters that venoms are extractable. Pain shrinks the world to size. Even the yellow jackets take a while to accept a change in circumstance, but they do. They do because the nest is all. If not this one, then the next. Consider the colony, the larva. I am a wasp, a hornet, a polywog. The mother tongue once bilged, spills its nouns and closes its vowels. We are obliged to adapt. It's okay to say the sun rises, to compare yourself to what at any given moment helps you get on. Strength is the illusion, survival the comedy. I drink hot coffee in the noontime sun and feel like my father. So I'll read a, a couple of these, these prose poems that I'm working on presently, which are, I don't know what to say about them. This one is called, Seems You Can Rationalize Just About Anything, or But the Cow Is Okay. A lot of things happened in, the, in a classroom as a teacher, and I realized how seldom all of that stuff gets into poems, so some of the effort of these poems is to get things in, in that often just gets passed by. So it seems you can rationalize just about anything, or but the cow is okay. Maybe the worst part of teaching is the regret you feel for a while until you forget about things you say or do in front of a mixed group of kids or young adults, kind of like the time I pantomime jerking off to a nun, my boss at the time, to indicate the futility of some endeavor or other, which I've never been sure if she caught or understood, which is maybe why everyone wants trigger warnings anymore. And I probably shouldn't have taped that kid to a post in 1999, even though he welcomed it, he was the headmaster's son. And maybe shouldn't have guided the children of hard right religious parents through meditations in the dark with candles lit, which cost the school tuition money, and certainly the Lady Gaga video was a mistake, however artful. And I probably should have notified the class more explicitly that I was about to show a Russian dash cam car crash that involved a live action human person being run over. I did really try to find first a 3D simulation. But that was the point being made to the fiction writer, that you have to sometimes research unpalatable things for the sake of art, because life is as unpalatable as death, by and large, and it matters that your character, when hit by the on-rushing red Ford Festiva, the mark of choice for some reason, performs the proper ragdoll physics, which in these cases is simply physics, and fly and bounce appropriately. This might have been okay had I stopped there, had I not succumbed to temptation and scrubbed back through the video, a long compilation of Russian dash cam car crashes, some quite horrific death on the highway type stuff, in an effort to get a laugh, even, and maybe worse, at the expense of an animal, a beast who, though penniless like the horse of Nicias and Xenophon's Oikonomikas, 
was noble in soul, comporting itself with honor after its nature, and is worthy of pity like us all, as even my young son said the other day, noting that monkeys were, obviously, half human, and that they, like us, and every creature must bear the burden of an anus, which is as good an argument against intelligent design as I have heard. But in this video, which also served to make one of those truth is stranger than fiction points, because it would be patently ridiculous to take a protagonist, say, driving along a country road, minding her own business, and make her plow into a cow and a bull crossing the road, one mounted on the back of the other, rolling the cow onto the hood with a thud and a cracking of windshield glass before it limps the rest of the way across the road, the bull in chase. But it's okay, I'm telling myself, to have subjected a group of would-be writers to this for a laugh if nothing else, because it was true after all, it happened. And we cannot be afraid of the truth. And none of us, by this point anyway, are innocent, despite the looks they feigned or what they whispered in the hall. And the cow, after all, was okay. This one is called, When Making Dolls Patterned After Fetishized Figures, The Rule Is Playfully Mangle the Pattern. What a relief, a study that finally gives the lie to the myth of endorphins. And by myth, I mean only the ideological tale. They aren't in themselves all marketers' prevarication, that they trigger the brain to unleash on runners a magical high, a euphoric sense of painlessness, the existence of which is true enough. I can attest that happens, and I remember my last one, sometime in the early aughts in Wichita, before the hip injuries, at the tail end of a 12-mile run, accelerating with awesome ease up hillside, which makes me think of my best friend and running mate at the time, a guy whose face I'd never recognized he had so much beard, who turned himself into a glass blower, whose ex-wife introduced me to Liquid Rock, a guy of unforgiving self-righteousness, who loved people as generously as he despised them. And when it came up, my turn to be disaffected for reasons I never wholly understood. I've never been so convinced that, as he claimed, I had a defective, malformed character. It turns out it's been cannabinoids all along, not that I have a point of comparison, since the last time I tried pot in Amsterdam, I really didn't inhale and spit into the sink of the hostel where I stayed that night because I didn't have corona enough to attend the sex shows. I credit those chemicals and poetry with keeping me out of psych wards, and there is nothing in my life that has or can replace them, the gut-felt well-being they bestowed, and as my body is too earthbound and my mind a cloud of this clarity. I'm sorry if you've never experienced it even once. It's some ecstatic shit, but then it's not like anyone goes looking for the life they end up with. I'm not supposed to tell you this, but some sick fuck mailed the president a bomb, sewn into the chest cavity of a dead baby. It only works because it's unbelievable, the kind of thing Snopes.com will say never happened. But there he was, if you can get your mind around the truth. The crack EOD specialist called in from Fort Blank, tasked with cutting the tiny, kind of redacted, because I'm not supposed to tell you the story, I swore I wouldn't. See, this is why I have a malformed character. I, I swore I wouldn't tell the story when I wrote a poem about it the next day. Flips in two with tin snips to liberate the tiny bomb, Probably, probably a cleverly encased C4 charge attached to a pressure-sensitive detonation device, but as I was Googling around about miniaturized explosives, I realized I was probably tripping an alert somewhere. Oh, my America. But the system is designed to keep our minds innocent, of, although we are, we are so grateful to the friendly explosive ordnance disposal man who showed up for work and has already drawn his paycheck, who has no choice but to endure the reward of surviving that scene having saved and shielded all of us from it, who must live now forever with the censorious reek of its four-dimensional knowledge, a data set stored in the cells that can only from here dismantle them. Read a couple more. <coughs> all right, so thank you all for coming out, and I will make way for Jennifer here after a couple of poems. This is called, We Do Whatever You Ask and Say. Begin with something, anything, crenellated, notched, a built-in place for gunners to stand and a place for them to hide. We forget the cannon is not a kind of gun, but the essence of gun, since we believe, as biology teaches, 
things progress simpler to complex, invented by angels to kill angels, and given its name not by Milton, who called it a pillar on wheels, imagined it belching from its hellish glut, thunderbolts and hail of iron globes, but by some rank Viking who named his war engine after his woman, Gunhilda, to inflame with longing his lonely job of disemboweling the enemy with fiery projectiles, far from home, but in the name of home. My last poem, I foresee the breaking of all that is breakable. Perhaps after all it is merely a desire to use the word thanatopsical. But if you can wash or handle artifacts like this blue tea mug carried from Crete as a gift from a friend, or this nacreous orange bowl, a honeymoon souvenir bought in a now defunct artist shop in Colorado, or this antique Chinese mud man carrying his sponges and fish from a day at the pier without a pathological fixation on the day you will stumble and drop it, or smack it against the sink divider, or brush it with a hand reaching for the letter opener, you are Junsu, a superior person, as Confucius had it. You probably make love to your spouse without imagining betrayal, and pay taxes without complaint, because you think nothing in truth belongs to you. They invented the earth for people like you, and then salted it. Thank you.